What is going on, everybody? Thanks for checking into our latest TDR Trade to Black podcast. Here's a stat that should grab your attention. Global cannabis sales back in 2020 were around $13 billion. But fast forward 11 years later to 2031, it's estimated it's supposed to grow to up to $150 billion. The evolution of an industry right in front of our very own eyes. So how will consumer habits and buying habits change during that timeline? And will the industry meet consumer demand during that time frame? Well, let's find out. Welcome in Anthony Varel. As we talk about a lot of commerce conversation today and the growth of an overall industry. But uh, this should be an interesting as we're going to bring in some interesting people over from Dutchie. But how are you? Yeah, good, good. It's good to uh, be able to sit down with Dutchie. I mean, we talked to a lot of operators um, on the front end from cultivation and distribution manufacturing. It's nice to finally get to uh, have a conversation with somebody in the from the tech space um, that's actually broadly touching pretty much all of the companies that, yeah. we, uh, that we talked to. Yeah, so let's welcome in the CTO of Dutchie. This is Chris, uh, Chris Ostrowski. Good to meet you. How are things? Good meeting you, actually, last month at the conference, Bizenga, Chicago. But uh, how was the uh, conference for you? Conference was wonderful. And yeah, thanks guys for having me on. Uh, definitely a big fan of the show. I've been watching for, Appreciate for, it. for quite a while now. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really cool to be on. Love your content. Yeah, Benzinga was awesome. Um, you know, with the backdrop of our largest product release that we've ever had, of Dutchie 2.0, uh, just a couple of weeks before Benzinga, jumping into, you know, in-person event. Uh, always a big fan of the Benzinga events. You get a lot done there. It's like the, the hyper-efficiency button, we like to say. When we go to those yeah. uh, conferences, we meet with a ton of customers. Uh, you know, it's cool to see some of the deal flow that's still happening in the industry. But uh, overall, I think just the uh, the questions that we get, the excitement that we've seen around some of the new uh, developments that we've had in the Dutchie product suite, uh, it was a really, really great event. So definitely thankful for the uh, Benzing crew. And yeah, it was, it was great to finally meet you in person. Know. We, just, we just caught each other in passing and uh, said, hey, I know that guy. Let's, uh, let's get <laughs> Yeah, Anthony was dealing with a hurricane. I had a medical emergency, so I was yeah. a little distracted. But now we're all was fine. Everything's good. But listen, good little time that we saw, obviously, in Chicago. What are some of the questions that you get asked a lot? Like, you know, I think for people that don't know you, you're a technology platform and uh, really an e-commerce platform. That's I think if my memory serves me correctly, you're over 6,000, working with over 6,000 dispensaries across the U.S. and Canada, correct? Yeah, that's correct. We're, uh, we're, we're probably over 6,500 stores across North 6, America. 6,500, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Dutchie really is kind of the, the largest technology provider in the Canada space uh, for really the full stack retail commerce experience. Everything from, as you already mentioned, e-commerce to, you know, in-store kiosk experiences to point of sale, cultivation and manufacturing. Uh, we really try to, you know, bring kind of the breadth and, and power of our platform uh, to really help our retail customers and uh, cultivation, manufacturing, everything that we can do, uh, you know, with the team that we have building the, the stack and building the, uh, the product behind us is, is all about you know, chasing efficiency, building these things uh, in, a, in a cohesive way. Hmm. So from, from an e-commerce perspective, I mean, what, what are you guys doing to stay relevant? What's been, I guess, the biggest component of the Dutchie 2.0 release um, that wasn't in the product before that's actually enabling um, these cannabis operators to create richer relationships with their consumers? Yeah, you know, um, it's a great question because we, we really, about a year ago, uh, you know, we, we took a step back in terms of where's the industry heading, how yeah. is our product, you know, really being developed to meet where the industry is going to be six months, a year, multiple years out from now. And when, you know, when you look at the cannabis industry, right, there's a lot of analogs, there's a lot of similarities to other commercial yeah. you know, retail industries, right? We, we can look at everything from, you know, CPG brands to the alcohol industry to, you know, all these different experiences. And it's really interesting to look at where consumer trends have continued uh, to really head towards. And one of the biggest gaps that we've seen in cannabis technology and just the cannabis retail experience overall is that personalization aspect, right? So if you okay. think first about any digital interaction you have now, you pull up Netflix, you open up DoorDash, it's really tailored to you, not somebody like you, but literally you. And with 2.0, one of the things we wanted to do was really weave that strategy into the entirety of our product suite. So in a big way, 2.0 wraps up uh, multiple enhancements we've made, not just to the e-commerce experience where everything you see on a menu, the entire shopping experience, the customer journey can be specific to that individual. Hmm. We've taken that to the point of sale, we've taken that to the kiosk experience in store. So you know we can dive a little bit deeper into what that ultimately means, but personalization is one of the most exciting technologies that we're, we're pushing and bringing into the industry that really can 
this technology just hasn't seen before. So when you say personalization, I mean, what level of personalization? So for instance, when it, before I, I'm a shopper online first before I go to brick and mortar, regardless of what it is, cannabis, goods, et cetera, I always will check the menu before I go to the dispensary. I so figured. in terms of personalization, is that, let's say, bringing up products that are going to fit my, let's say, buying patterns and previous purchases? It'll prioritize those within the queue. So the flower that's displayed on the screen will look different from, let's say, the flower that Shad's looking at um, from his customer view. Right. Yeah. I mean, Anthony, if you want a product job at, at Dutchie, you know, we're, we're hiring. <laughs> yeah. Well said. Uh, I mean, really, it truly is. Um, you know, we've seen some of this development and some of it kind of exists in, in other parts of the customer journey, specifically in cannabis. But we haven't seen that the hyper specific one to one. Uh, experience where Anthony has previously shopped at the store. He's, he's looked at certain products. He's bought certain products. Let's understand at a really deep level, why those specific products use that information to, to then make recommendations for other products that you should be trying. And what we're doing is, is not just kind of taking from a, a surface level. Um, you know, you could kind of think of as like clustering. Oh, so Anthony is like this consumer. It's actually a lot deeper than that to say, Anthony is one of one. He likes. Yeah certain price category, he likes a certain, you know, consumption method, and he likes a certain terpene profile, right? There's a, there's millions of different ways to consume the plant that we all know and love. Let's bring, you know, large data models, which is what we've done here at Dutchie, where we've actually trained a proprietary machine learning algorithm to, okay. to Anthony has specific requirements, things that he might not even know. I mean, one of the things that we've also been really proud of is too many customers, they come into the store, they just want the highest potency product, right? Okay. Right. So hundreds, if not thousands of bud tenders that just want to talk to a customer about, let's talk about a certain terpene that you might like, right? Mm -hmm. By leveraging really, really large data sets and, and specific data sets to you as a consumer, we can kind of bring those, those, you know, that intersection and say, hey, Anthony, you're going to love these products. And over time, we can maybe help correct some of that industry behavior where I'm just after the highest test turns into I'm after a limonene product because that's, you know, one of my favorite, one of my favorite terps um, to actually go yes. after. So when we talk about personalization, we really mean molding a customer journey that is only going to be experienced by you because that's the best possible version of that experience. Hmm. Okay. And when you, what, go ahead, Chad. I was going to say, so you're working with 65 different, 6,500 different dispensaries across the country right now. How much have you seen the industry grow and become more educated and be more aware about the industry as a whole? Because we all know we've got the advocate, you know, the, the, the hardcore cannabis consumers that have been around since day one, but we all know the future of this industry. It's outside of flowers. There's other things that are involved and it's about reaching mainstream audience. So since the time that you started with Dutchie, the first five months in, like I said, to where we are now, how much has it grown and people becoming more familiar and what are some of their buying habits that have changed since during that time? Yeah, I think, you know, what we really saw, um, you know, especially as, and it's, it's so market specific, right? Um, so what we, we certainly see is a trend towards efficiency. Uh, once you get that, you know, maybe we kind of bucket them into the can of curious consumer. Once they find the product that works for them and they kind of become that uh, more habitual, um, you know, repeat shopper, we see people really settle into a certain kind of, I want to make sure that my experience is repeatable and efficient. So yeah. I a lot of the growth that we've seen in the industry, and of course, it's it's so market specific. Where you know you see that that price compression curve hit some markets, and then you start seeing retailers trying to adjust to to target a certain segment. Um, but we certainly see consumers continuing to uh, look for the product that works best for them. But over time, right, that can become a little bit tired, especially for a retailer that's that's trying to find the best margin profile. Mm -hmm. So what we what we've started to see is really a consumer behavior shift, you know, not just repeatability, but a lack of maybe trying new things. And that can be really, really difficult for a business, not just from a, hey, are we pushing the products? Are we you know, selling the products that have the best, um, you know, bottom line efficiency for our business? But also, am I keeping a customer interested in coming back to my store because mm -hmm. of the aspect of education and discovery? That's why when we can really leverage personalization tech to put it in, you know, hey, you have that buy it again button, which is super, super popular on the Dutch e-commerce platform. But right next to that button better be a, a, an informed recommendation 
on what the best product you know that they might want to try out is. So we're trying to see if we can really unlock a, a habitual buying experience that also lends to discovery and trying new products. The skew turnover in this, this industry is wild. You know, you'll see products be on a, on a show for two years and then never come back again. So you want to make sure that you can have that repeatability and that yeah. efficiency of buying experience. At the same time, though, you got to keep customers trying new products. Yeah. So you're talking about discovery and let's say buying habits. A lot of, I don't want to call it a pain point because it's an integral part of this industry, but, but bud tenders. Yeah. Um, when I was kind of prepping for the interview, it got my gears spinning a little bit. One thing that I heard Mark Benioff talk about a lot on the last Dreamforce call, and I think his last earnings call were agents as it relates to AI. Yeah. Um, with this engine that you guys are building, and let's say with consumer preferences, and as much as we don't want to think so, there is obviously always an inherent bias in a bud tender. Um, they can gravitate towards one brand, they can gravitate towards one product. Have you guys explored or have thought about, for instance, like AI agents that could replace, let's say, a bud tender at the point of sale via a kiosk that'll be able to streamline and optimize that buying experience as well as match that consumer with what their actual preferences are um, at the point of sale? Yeah, it's, it's a great thought. I mean, a lot of the cool developments right now in agentic tech are, are really exciting. I think our strategy right now is really more augmenting and kind of like giving butt tenders superpowers. Okay. I've been in the industry for over eight years now, seeing, you know, the, the progression of the early days of, of a market where you have a, a butt tender that's working at a retailer that builds up that kind of book of customers that are constantly coming in and saying, I like to work with Anthony because Anthony knows what I like as the market matures. And we've seen this in every single market um, over time. Staff turnover is tough, right? It's, it's hard as a, as a retailer to keep that connective tissue there. What we see as an application of you know, personalization technology and AI technology is that we can bring a lot of the information that we know about a consumer and yep. put it in front of the butt tender. So instead of replacing the butt tender, we can actually augment the sale, the selling experience where I think you guys have probably experienced it. You walk into a store, you meet with a new butt tender that you never talked to before and they go, well, what do you want? Let's fix that, right? Let's make it more of, hey, Anthony, welcome back in. Uh, I see you had those edibles, you know, from wild last time. How was that? Start a conversation. Give your staff the tools to actually, you know, be the uh, the sellers that every single general manager wants their their butt tender to be. There's also of course, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Chad. What's every shopper want? They want to know that you've done your homework and there's a little bit of background so they understand. You know, anytime that you want to get through to anybody and you've had a case call with, you know, even your telecom phone and you're dealing with an issue and there's a case number behind it and there's a little research behind it, that's what's going to be key. But the key thing here, I just want to like emphasize in what you just said, AI will not replace the bud tender. It'll just make them more sophisticated at what they do, correct? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's the right path. And, and, you know, we're, we don't try to be overly prescriptive for our customers. That's a lot of different models. I think there's there's definitely an opportunity for, uh, you know, AI technology to help customers find products themselves, kind of that self-guided shopping experience. You're not always going to have the opportunity to have a butt tender, you know, talking to them. So whether it's a kiosk in the store that does kind of offer that digital discovery experience because you just don't have the, the you know, the workforce, the sheer numbers to have that one-to-one -one conversation with every single shopper, and then, of course, in e-commerce, when, you know, they're remote, they're not there in front of you. So it's hard to have that conversation. There's definitely a good application. And the personalization is that personalization engine that we built in-house is definitely uh, something that we plan to bring to that digital shopping experience where it's yeah. more conversational. It's not, it's, hey, tell me what effects you're going after. Tell me, uh, you know, what kind of experience you want to have with a product and helping that customer discover. And we certainly have a number of, of partners that have, you know, tackled this problem as well. Uh, continuing to work and partner with them has definitely been exciting. Hmm. Now, I mean, you work with most of the top MSOs or most of the top retailers in the space. When we're talking about that personalization to peel back the onion, I guess, to a certain degree, does that mean that there is a profile for Anthony in your backend database that's visible at, let's say, Cureleaf and at Trueleaf, or it's my personal experience with Trueleaf or with Cureleaf? Um, from a personalization perspective? Yeah, we, we take uh, customer data sovereignty and uh, ownership very, very seriously here. Okay. Uh, so uh, to directly answer that, no, you have a profile with Trueleaf, you have a profile with Cureleaf, and they do not okay. intersect. 
right? Um, okay. We see there's obviously a big opportunity in the data space still uh, within cannabis. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, I would say, consumer trends, shopping behavior, trying to understand what customers are ultimately after. That has a lot of value. Uh, we think that can be brought to bear uh, to ultimately help our retailers within their own four walls. Um, we're certainly you know, keeping our eye on the industry in terms of you know, where some of these data aggregators are going. Um, but you know, we really think that we can build a product and build a business um, that doesn't kind of resort to, to maybe some not so nice competitive behavior between our, our retail partners. Yeah, that's yeah. completely, completely understood. And then another thing that I know you guys are known for is loyalty, um, consumer loyalty, and it's been built up. I've had conversations with many of the operators around what they're doing to enhance their consumer loyalty and then obviously drive that into marketing and overly into sales. What's the key to that or what what have you built into the Dutchie platform to, I guess, equip them with um, the tools yeah. that they need to build those loyalty and engagement programs for their customers? Loyalty is a big topic in this industry. Um, you know, you, you can't really be a retailer these days and, and not offer a robust loyalty program. So we've uh, had a lot of success over the years partnering, uh, you know, with, with some of our, uh, our third party loyalty providers, the Alpines, Spring Bigs, you know, the happy captures of yeah. the world. And uh, we're excited to keep investing in those relationships. Um, but as part of 2.0, we also, you know, announced to the world that Dutchie's bringing a first party, you know, marketing automation and loyalty platform uh, to, the, to, to the industry. Um, something that we think is going to be really, really powerful where you can use this whole kind of ecosystem, uh, bring it all to bear, where we're not stitching together different point solutions, which it can be done and it can work. Uh, but there's certainly a lot of power in the simplicity of just having it all be tightly integrated and work directly inside the platform. So we've seen, you know, the, the development and trend of consumer behavior where they're, they're looking for loyalty programs and they're shopping based on the rewards that are available to them, the loyalty points that they've accrued. Yeah. Um, we think there's an opportunity to really uh, bring that experience uh, in a more simplified manner, um, help our customers not just give away margin, because that's what we keep seeing left and right, is these loyalty programs, um, they maybe lack the, the oversight or they lack the insight to say, here's how this should be uh, you know, discounted, here's how you should be doing point accruals. That's a lot of our, our new reporting technology coming into the fold to say, hey, okay. based on shopping trends, based on where your customers are, are at in the, the customer journey, you should be discounting this way, you should be providing a loyalty program this way, um, but then making sure that that's a really, really clean consumer journey along the way, not sending them off to third party sites. It's all about keeping them within your four walls, keeping them focused on your specific brand. We live in 2024 and about to 2025, but it's not just about doing what you're doing now. It's all about collecting data, which obviously you guys are doing and doing very, very well. But have you paid much attention to this U.S. election? I know there's been talks of like, you know, could we have a new administration in play and could we see safe banking pass during lame duck session? I don't want to speculate because I have no idea as to when and if that does happen. But if safe banking were to pass, like how much would that change, I guess, your industry or your your company specifically? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the biggest thing that we see with, with safe, um, I guess, specific to Dutchie itself is um, how underbanked this industry is. Uh, you know, Dutchie, yeah. we're, we're a full stack vertical software provider. So we, like I said, provide everything from e-commerce to point of sale, but we also provide um, payment processing. And uh, if anybody that's ever been involved in any way, uh, the retail cannabis industry knows payment processing is, is tough. Uh, right. It's, you know, we're kind of just at the mercy of a couple of these card networks and, um, we don't have a lot of control, we don't have a lot of say, and a lot of that does come down to the, the federal regulations. So we see safe banking as a big way uh, to increase the legitimacy, um, increase the consumer experience, the fact that you can't walk into a dispensary day and just tap your credit card and walk out. Um, that, that harms the industry more than just- of What's course. the feedback you get from consumers? They don't have that option. Are they frustrated? Like, what do you hear back from them knowing that there's limited options as to how they can purchase product? Yeah, I mean, like a lot of things in cannabis, a lot of it has to do with consumer education. Uh, I like to think that we should be working together as, as you know, not just a platform, but also with our retail partners to educate the public. I don't think the public knows at large uh, that don't. It's a serious problem. One of our customers out in, in Oregon, uh, you know, there was just a, a fatal uh, shooting at their dispensary because they have so much cash on hand. The bad guys know it. This is a multifaceted problem and safe banking. We're excited about it. We're obviously going to stay optimistic. Uh, you know, we don't always want to be Lucy with the football. But it does seem like having two candidates, you know, primary candidates in this election, uh, both yeah. being pro-cannabis, we should all be really excited 
that you know safe banking will happen sooner rather than later. It's tough to say if anything's going to happen this year, but uh, we're going to stay optimistic. Yeah, yeah I mean, you have you, you have some S tier, uh, you have some S tier VCs on your cap table um, from a previous raise. I mean, D one Thrive, sure. Tiger. Um, are you hearing anything or any sort of sentiment around how either of these administrations could go on the industry or how rescheduling um, they think is going to shape up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the rescheduling process is is um, you know more likely to happen sooner uh, than safe banking at this point. Of course, yeah. Uh, you know, the ALJ, we're, in the past couple of days, we've seen some really positive momentum that there could be an expedited process happening here before the end of the current administration. Uh, you know, it's tough to say, looking at the crystal ball, uh, again, the fact that both candidates are, are pro-cannabis and have publicly stated that they have you know strong support uh, for cannabis, it can only be a good thing for our industry. Um, you know, as far as uh, some of kind of the blue chip funds, um, there's a reason they've invested in Dutchie, right? They yeah. they see the, uh, the the tailwinds and and they know that it's only a matter of time, uh, not a, not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when on some of these federal regulations changing. Well, when you look at even outside of cannabis. You know, my wife is not going to the grocery store to buy dish soap. She's buying this stuff online. And it same applies for pretty much anything that you're buying right now. Where do you think just brick and mortar dispensaries? Question really for both of you and how to look in this industry 10 years from now. Because as I said off the top, from 2020 to 2031, we're going to grow from basically an annual revenue sales of $13.4 billion to around $150 billion, which is a big increase. So... I can't help but think that e-commerce is going to be front and center, especially as the industry starts to basically build and you get those first time consumers start to understand who they are and what they want through the, uh, you know, uh, improvements of AI and the data that's being collected. But what really happens to a lot of these brick and mortar dispensaries in 10 years from now? Yeah, you know, I, I do think that they are, are still very much uh, kind of a, a cornerstone of the industry. Um, yes. You know, there's there's certainly the, the doom and gloom thought that, you know, maybe something happens where direct to consumer is more in play. Um, frankly, I don't see that happening anytime soon. I think the regulatory oversight that while, of course, it's a burden, uh, it does provide a lot of consumer trust. Cannabis yep. regulated uh, substance is still it's still new. Uh, you know, it, it feels like we've been at this for a while. But uh, the reality is, if you look at other you know regulated substances, uh, this is still early days. And. We want to see more consumers, you know, switching off of maybe more harmful substances like alcohol and moving to to cannabis. That's a function of time and that's a function of consumer trust. I know. And I think using the brick and mortar uh, kind of hyper local, highly local uh, model is going to help build and continue that, that consumer trust. And we want to, of course, see evolution of lab testing. We want to see all of this really you know, go from something that's such a burden and something that's hurting, you know, ultimately the growth of the industry to more of go with the regulated market because as a consumer, you know what you're getting, you know it's safe. That's what we want to continue to see. I don't think there's going to be much of a change ultimately uh, in, in the role of the brick and mortar location. I can see a world where um, maybe there's less foot, foot traffic for brick and mortar, where we can kind of look more towards local delivery. I think most cannabis consumers are not buying it, you know, to like, the, it's, not, it's not buying dish soap, right? You want to consume it right now. So you want that right. local delivery experience uh, and that's where I think you know we're going to continue to see more of a trend there. Delivery hasn't quite gotten fully out of the gates just yet. Uh, yeah, that has to do, frankly, with things like 280E and rescheduling, where just the actual net margin on running a delivery service is just it doesn't pencil out right now. I think that'll change. I think we'll see a lot more uh, delivery, um, you know, injection and influence over the next 10 years. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, um, especially with brick and mortar. I mean, just look at the analogous form factors and pharmacies and liquor stores. They're Good still point. here, they're still thriving. Um, as far as delivery goes, I mean, cannabis is a pretty big industry. It's just going to get bigger. I mean, do you see someone like an Uber, let's say coming into the delivery realm and integrating it into their app that already has all the optionality in there, or there being a, startup, let's say in the cannabis logistics space that, that <clears throat> dares, that dares to get into that delivery business aligned with the, uh, with the brick and mortar retailers. Sure. I, I, I think so. I think a lot of the value that, you know, um, you know, ultimately what they really are, Uber, DoorDash, um, you know, Lyft, ultimately what they really are, are their, their hyperlocal logistics networks and yeah. that's the true power. Um, so yes, I, I do think that we would see them, you know, enter, uh, the market. Uh, I think that should be a positive for retailers. Um, you know, 100%. let's not fight it. Let's partner. 
Um, and this is where, you know, we need regulations to change. Right now, right, it's not possible. Every delivery driver, for the most part, uh, it's different in different markets, but for the most part, that delivery driver, they have to be a full-time employee of the dispensary. Some markets actually require two employees of the dispensary to be in the car at all times during a delivery. Yeah. We need to see that evolve. Um, you know, there's this is just how it goes. The regulations, they kind of design the most stringent version that they can out the gate, and then things evolve and things change. So, you know, I think we should welcome it. I think it's great. Uh, when as a retailer, we can really think about how can I get, you know, my products, how can I get my brand in front of a consumer? How can I make it so that their delivery experience is really easy? I think it'd be wonderful if you could order a pizza on DoorDash and double dash, you know, in an eighth of, uh, of that's That'd be great. Part, correct. I think that's something that will ultimately help the industry because then you're thinking about it as, you know, it's a, a hyper local logistics platform meshed with a demand generation platform. And that can be really, really good for the industry. Yeah, um, I think the sales velocity, I think the sales velocity would go off the charts if there yeah. was inst if there was delivery at the speed of, let's say, like an Uber Eats, um, people would be, uh, it's obviously anecdotal, but I mean, I think the impact on business would be very high impact. What's the current challenges right now with the clear de delivery model that's in place right now for many companies that you're hearing? Yeah, yeah. It's alluded to. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's something you it's touched on. It's just um, delivery in any business is, is, is hard, you know, not just for cannabis. Um, but a lot of the regulations, I think if you talk to a lot of retailers, the regulations really just destroy the ultimate margin profile. Yeah. That with what a lot of markets are seeing on price compression, uh, it just doesn't become a, a tenable business. It's, it's there. It's great. Yeah. I can order, you know, from my local dispensary <clears throat> up to my house in 30 minutes and I can use, you know, the Dutchie pay by bank platform to have a digital payment experience. It's wonderful. Um, but I know that for the vast majority of retailers that have tried delivery, uh, it's, it's hard uh, to keep it sustainable and it's, it's hard to not, you know, have to subsidize the cost of delivery with, with revenue from your, your in-store model. Hmm. Well, we live and we learn. I think the biggest takeaway I can hear from you, and I, I think you would agree with this, Anthony, is, is that if you have an idea, don't do it once, do it multiple times. Consistency is important in this industry. And if you can build off that over a period of time and sustain it, uh, you start to really build a, a name, a brand. And this is badly what this industry needs right now, because we all know when it came to consistency in the early days, and we still are in somewhat the early days, those were a lot of challenges for a lot of companies in multiple ways that uh, work within this space. But when I look at this, some of the numbers that come to mind, $22 billion in annual transaction volume, a million daily transactions, as I said earlier, over 6,500 dispensaries. So onwards and upwards, right, Chris? Couldn't say it better myself. Yeah, we're really proud of, of the growth and the trust that we have from our customers. Uh, you know, we in many ways see ourselves growing up with the industry itself. Uh, and yeah, we're not slowing down anytime soon. Well, I appreciate some of the insight on just some of the industry trends. And uh, thanks for checking in and let's keep in touch. I know you're a Lions fan based in Detroit. So big game here uh, coming up with the Packers. But uh, let's see who wins and is ultimately the top team in the league. But uh, go Lions, right? Go Lions. All right. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Have me on, guys. Hey, everybody. Thanks again for watching. Where does time go? We're already at Q4 2024 as we get ready for a big federal election here in the U.S. What's going to happen? Who's going to win? And what kind of impact will it have on the cannabis industry? We'd love to get your feedback. If there's any guests that we've missed, leave some comments below. As usual, make sure to smash that like button and click on that bell for all notifications to get the latest information that we share here on the TDR Trade to Black podcast. And if you haven't done so already, make sure to subscribe to our channel because we wouldn't be here without you. Thanks again, everybody, for watching.